let me introduce our first speaker. You know, food doesn't just happen. It doesn't arrive on our plates or even in our supermarkets by accident or by magic. There's a complex network of processing and delivery of supply and demand that determines what's available for people to purchase and to eat. Our first speaker, Dr. Mariah Emke, is an expert on food, its supply and its consumption. Her knowledge of growing produce began with her childhood on a farm in Kansas, which she didn't fly away from. And her training and research have encompassed the role of food production and agribusiness firms, as well as nation-to-nation -nation trade in food. She raises questions of customer preference and how that's channeled up and down the supply chain. How do people get what they want to eat? One example of my, Mariah's research is the economics of obesity, looking at children's desire for natural sweets, as well as the influence of parenting on their consumption of sweets and then its impact on obesity. In recent years, I have found that the topic of honey regularly appears in conversations with Mariah. <laughs> Dr. Emke received her PhD from Purdue University in 2005 and was hired that year here at the University of Wyoming, where she's now an associate professor of agriculture and applied economics. She teaches agricultural entrepreneurship and that all-important course, the Senior Capstone Seminar, helping students bring together everything they've learned over the previous four years. Mariah has lived in New Zealand for two, two long-term stays, gaining an international perspective on food production, and her international interests likewise appear in her research into consumer preferences with regard to food's country of origin, from Niger to China to the United States. It is this broad set of perspectives that she brings to today's topic, sour whiskey, cheap wine, plastic milk, and snake oil, food fraud from national and international supply chains. Dr. Emke. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here today. And although I have, I guess, some undesirable terms in my title, I can't wait to talk to you about them. So, sour whiskey seems so fitting for Jackson, Wyoming, and thinking about the Western culture that you have here. Um, and when today we may think of that as an Old West sort of topic, but actually we have a lot of if you will, if not, it may taste okay, but it comes through sort of sour supply chains, whiskey in this world. There's more Scottish whiskey, for instance, sold in China than Scotland actually produces. So somewhere <laughs> along the supply chain, something is happening. And that is the focus of this presentation and research I am doing at the University of Wyoming, along with colleagues at Colorado State, NC State, in Australia, New New Zealand and the UK. So I'm looking forward to giving you a little insight into the problems that are tr like challenging, shall we say, agricultural economists such as myself. You may not be familiar with agricultural economics. You've probably heard of economists, like the people who run the Federal Reserve. But what are agricultural economic economists? I am one of them. And perhaps you have heard of it. And you have an idea of someone who works with um, cows and plows and those sorts of things. And I do some things with cattle and ranching. But my main focus has been consumer economics and food policy. And that is what we'll be talking about today. So just to give you an overview of my presentation, I'll be giving you a background on how academically we define food fraud and where it sort of come, come to our discipline's um, focus of late and how it's come to the focus. Uh, we'll talk about different types of food fraud. I'll actually, as Paul alluded to, I've spent a lot of time thinking about honey and the honey market and we'll do a little bit of a case study, if you will, of the honey market and food fraud in that, in that market and what it teaches us about food fraud overall. And then different measures we can think about for industry, government, and you as consumers to take to try to prevent food fraud. So I don't want this to be a scary presentation. Really, <laughs> my, first, my first point that I really want to make is that the world's food supply is 
safer than it has been at almost any point in history. We have better biological, chemical, and physical science going into the production of food. It is amazing what we have accomplished in terms of bringing about better food safety in our world. This is a diagram that demonstrates how the how salmonella rates have been brought down in the chicken industry. It's from a new 2017 publication by the USDA. And you'll see in 2000, we didn't have a lot of salmonella, actually in, in some ways, but any salmonella is not the greatest thing. We had about 1% um, of the young, if you look on the left, 1% of young chickens that were being butchered, if they tested them coming off of the production line, they found that about 1% of them contained some salmonella across all processors in the United States. By 2014, we brought that down to almost 0% in terms of when regularly tested through measures that our government has taken, the industry has taken to try to make food inspection more transparent and communicate what is going on. So I don't want you to leave here today worrying about every bite you take. But <laughs> my second point is, unfortunately, the food supply chain is more vulnerable than it has ever been at almost any point in history. And this isn't particularly due to the science, but it is due to us, the humans, and the human factors and our we're kind of difficult to control, actually. Um, we think viruses and pathogens are hard to control. We're hard to control. So just to give you an example of what's going on in terms of food fraud, in the EU, this is just as of mid-year in July, they had already confiscate, confiscated over 9,800 tons of illegally imported or um, diverted food. And um, this is worth about 230 million euros, so that's EU figures. And global trade for food that has been handled in some sort of fraudulent way constitutes a global market worth about $40 billion. And so this figure is pretty amazing within itself. But if we look at the value of other illegal markets, such as that as the one for illegal drugs, um, well, identity theft and illegal firearms, we find that this 40, so this is $40 billion a year we have in a, the illegal trading of food. It surpasses the amount of illegal drugs that are um, traded in the world, as well as the amount of the value of identity theft, theft in this world, which is, was about a billion dollars. These are all according to the United Nations. And then actually, I was sort of surprised that comparatively, this, the sale and, um, and illegal distribution of small arms is only, if you will, around valued to be around 320 billion or million dollars, excuse me. Whereas food fraud costs the world approximately 40 billion dollars in illegal trades. So it is not a small issue, it is actually quite a large issue. Um, so and what is kind of more concerning about this is that a lot of this revenue that is gained off of the illegal food market is going, so a lot of it is done in sort of a white collar crime um, situation, but increasingly organized crime and terrorism groups are looking as if at food as a way to launder money and finance their operations. So the food fraud is defined as occurring when there's illegal deception in the production and marketing of goods for economic gain, often leading to the adulteration of food products. Food fraud is not bioterrorism. Bioterrorism is com committed when people have the sole intent of hurting other people. Food fraud also is not necessarily the same as um, food safety. You may be familiar, if you're a movie buff, perhaps you watched the movie The Informant with Matt Damon playing the role of the troubled James Whitaker in the 1990s ADM scandal. In this scandal, ADM colluded with other manufacturers of lysine, a feed additive for pork production, to set the global market price for lysine. And 
well, I doubt you lay awake at night worrying about lysine. A lot of people didn't and didn't realize that this was going on for some time. And so what happened was in the 1990s, this was considered an amazing surprise, if you will, because at that point in time, it didn't seem possible that there were only four different lysine producers in the world and they were mainly located in Korea and Japan. And it seemed very difficult for a firm in the United States and these different countries to collude. But as if you think about that situation and the advances we've had in internet technology and information sharing, it's also easier than ever to do industrial collusion as well as for a non, um, more rogue organization such as organized crime and terrorist groups to collude around food. Food fraud doesn't always result in a food safety risk. Food safety in, our, in my ec agricultural economics world is more strictly defined around incidences where we have unintentional harm that enters the food system, if you will. There's pathogens or viruses that somehow get on our food and then we ingest them. And it is an accident. No one intentionally meant for those things to happen. So we've had incidences where pigs go through a vegetable patch and we then have E. coli and different things ending up on our vegetables. No one directed the wild pigs to do that. Food fraud occurs when someone is intentionally doing something to try to make a little bit more money. Sometimes these people may not realize they may be criminals who aren't particularly tuned into food production processes and may do something they don't realize is going to hurt people. And that's also when then food fraud produces a food safety risk. So for instance, in 2008 in China, you may recall that there was an instance where melamine was added to baby formula there. And you may wonder like, how did melamine ever get, melamine is a plastic product, how did that ever enter the baby formula supply chain? Well, prior to this happening, what had happened is the Chinese government had increased their regulations for infant formula. They wanted to see higher protein levels in infant formula. And I should actually preface this and say, I am not a chemist or an organic chemist. And I know there's some of you out here who are from the food industry and will, will know the chemistry of this better than I do. But one way that they test for protein levels in infant formula is to test for the amount of nitrogen that is produced in samples. And the melamine provided that nitrogen boost. So in order to meet the new government regulations for protein, somewhat dubious actors in China thought, hey, let's just put some melamine powder in the, in the milk powder and that will boost our nitrogen levels and then we'll get this premium associated with higher protein levels. It isn't clear whether the people who thought, hey, let's, let's, um, let's add some melamine, thought about the potential infants they would kill the, the, and the many ill people that would cause but indeed, that resulted in a major food safety incident where um, I believe approximately 50 children were killed. Um, many people developed um, other side effects, intestinal problems, and ultimately, actually, one of the, the executives within a Chinese firm there was executed for the whole situation letting it arise. So, in order to understand food fraud, I do want to touch a little bit on what the food supply chain looks like and sort of typically what agricultural economists see as consisting of what the food supply chain consists of. A lot of us in Wyoming work at this level, the producer level. These are the people on the farms, on the ranches, in the vegetable gardens, in the greenhouses, producing the basic commodities of the food you eat. A lot of times though, you don't eat that directly from the farm, right? It goes through some processes before you, it gets to you. So if you think of beef production, beef may be sold from Wyoming. It may go in, in that case we have feedlots, may go and be backgrounded at a feedlot. And then it is sent to the processor, the next step 
in the food supply chain. And at this point, the food is processed and made more presentable, or it could be, if it's lettuce, it's being washed, it's being cleaned for you. If it's beef, it's being cut up, it's being ground, those sorts of things. It is then sold typically, sometimes it goes directly from processor to retailer, but then there's usually a wholesaler involved who does warehousing and distribution, and then it goes to the retailer at the end, which in the in just a little bit of a side note, food retailing is actually going through an amazing bit of change right now. Um, as retailers, we've gone from mom and pop to big grocery stores such as Kroger, and now we're moving into this world where Amazon is entering and we're going to have, uh, I think the, the future of our food retailing is going to be moving and changing even more. And so you may go to the grocery store to buy your food, you may order it online, but either way, you're look, that's, that's the, the retail step. Food fraud is most likely to occur at the intersections of these links in the supply chain, either from producer to processor, where perhaps um, a, a defect, uh, how do you say, a poorly produced product is substituted in with higher quality products into the processing change, or once it has um, been processed, there, there can be diversion or different things happening between the processor and wholesaler step. I was looking this morning at, um, and this would probably be from wholesaler to retailer, but it was news from England where a criminal gang had been busted for doing two things. First off, they were um, stealing high quality luxury cars and reselling them such as Jaguar and Land Rovers and all those different things. And the second thing was they had stolen a semi load of Nutella and, <laughs> and we're, we're reselling that to try to make money. So they were probably operating between that wholesaler and retailer stage. Some, there's some classic examples of food fraud in industries that are more prone to food fraud. Um, one of the first ones that comes to mind actually in a number of different ways, I have a picture of sushi here, but the seafood. The fish on the sushi is very susceptible to food fraud. Actually, there was a study done, not in Wyoming, so you can rest easy, but I believe it was in um, Michigan and the Northeast, where approximately 80% of the sushi being sold in sushi restaurants wasn't really the fish that they said it was. Um, and so we have a very hard time as consumers really differentiating, especially perhaps, maybe if I were Japanese, I'd be better, um, what is truly yellowfin and what is not yellowfin tuna. Um, and then, so seafood in and of itself has a lot of fraud taking place. It's a high value product. This can take place in a lot of different ways. When people pack the fish in ice to be shipped, they can put more ice in and make it heavier, and so they get more value out that way. You can swap species, people may not know. Um, you can also, in a world where we, we want to pay more for wild-caught, say, salmon instead of farm-raised salmon, sometimes that farm-raised gets substituted in for wild-caught. Another thing that uh, appears on your sushi platter is rice. Rice, which also is in my little bag there, it's in developing countries, that's where we see a lot of food, food fraud is in rice and milk. Um, rice, you can, the, the sort of most dubious examples are putting in little white rocks that look like rice into rice bags and then selling it on. Um, you can also put in pasta that isn't really rice and make it look like rice. But that's an area where there tends to be a lot of fraud historically. Also, kind of in Korea, Japan, in Asian countries, there's a large problem. This is a, over here on the right, upper right, is a picture of dumplings with chopsticks. And um, basically, anytime you have a ground meat filling going into something and you can't really tell what it is, that's more likely to be a target for food fraud. And so in countries like Japan and China, that's where they see a lot of problems with people putting in non-meat fillings into fillings. You've probably also heard like of, of sausages containing sawdust and those sorts of things. So that's all right, adulteration. Milk, as I mentioned, the China case earlier, that's one really 
I would say right now the most famous case of milk. We've also seen melamine arise in other milk markets, especially through developing countries in Iran and India. Um, another way milk can be adulterated adulterated is that instead of just selling milk, water's added to it and it's cut down so it isn't as strong a milk, or you could sell water that's colored white and try to claim it is milk. So there's a lot of ways that milk can be adulterated and, and sold on. And the, the infant formula situation in China is kind of if you will, it's different than these liquid situations because that was where you're deal dealing with the powdered milk market. And one thing, um, as Paul mentioned, I've spent some time living in New Zealand. And in 2015, I did my sabbatical there. And I'd heard about the, the bilamine scandal in China and those different things. But I didn't realize how far reaching it was in that New Zealand has the largest um, milk cooperative in the world, Fonterra. The scandal did touch one of their plants, which caused a decline in the value of their product and actually a small recession in the New Zealand economy. So food fraud doesn't just affect the firms or just the consumers, say, within a particular niche. It can actually have far-reaching economic consequences. Um, so one of the first writers who wrote about food adulteration in food fraud was a gentleman by the name of Akum. He was a German who immigrated into England in the 19th century. And he wrote a great book, if you're into reading um, books about food safety, um, <laughs> a great book about instances of, of adulteration and scandalous food acts in Britain. And kind of a classic example at that time was, and there's, there continues to be like in pickled and processed products. So the, this middle picture is a, a picture of pickles that a sort of classic old fashioned way to adulterate pickles was to take copper filings and file them into the pickle jar, so then it would look greener. Another, um, another industry where we see a lot of fraud, this is just, this is a picture of beer, but was within the wine and spirits industry. As I mentioned the case with China where we have more Scottish whiskey being sold there than actually is produced. There's also issues, of course, with very valuable products like champagne and aged wines where people may substitute in inferior goods in those cases for those, those different things. Also, they can add dyes and additives that you may not know about as a consumer to try to you know, boost the value of, of different products. So there's the scary stories, if you will, of, of food fraud. Um, we do see two broad trends in food fraud and the types of products that have fraud instances. And you see it basically ba on the left here in the red I have, it's either typically to be, tends to be in premium markets where they're high value products, where people are paying a premium to them, and there's a wide margin there if you can sell an inferior product for that premium price. So Scotch whiskey is an example of a premium product where we see a lot of fraud. I work in the honey markets, and really honey was kind of, if you will, honey was honey, until, uh, I, I want to say until the last 10 years. The first time I lived in New Zealand, I was a student, and we used to go into the dining hall every day, and our morning, our afternoon tea, we, we could have tea, and we could have toast with honey on it, and we would get these huge vats of honey. And it had a very distinct taste, and I, I grew to like it, but I didn't know at that time I was eating something extra special. So I was, when I was a student there, it was in 1997, and there's all this honey around from these manuka plants. And they had so much honey, kind of honey running out of their ears, if you will. So we got big vats on our tables. This honey was used as a sweetener to add to cattle feed to get the cattle to eat more. So it didn't have a lot of value, really. I mean, it's, it's, uh, feeding it to college students and cattle, right? <laughs> um, so. But in the early 2000s, some creative food scientists there discovered that manuka honey had extra special cleansing and medicinal properties. And so 
It is a great solve to put on burns because not only does it close off the burns and, and prevent more microbes and those sorts of things from getting in, it actually has like a little hydrogen peroxide type property and it cleans the burns and has some sort of anti um, microbial and antibacterial properties to it. So this stuff I used to get to eat for like free almost is now worth over, in some cases, can be worth as much as uh, $100 for a few ounces. So we have this very high value honey that's out there on the international market, which has of course invited a lot of frauds to try to sell honey that isn't Manuka honey for this high dollar price. So we see that in this, in Manuka honey in particular, but it's also happened in the United States with other types of honey, which I'll tell you more about in a few minutes. Fraud is historically um, very rampant on the herbs and spices markets. If you think about it, if you think about spices such as turmeric and saffron that have great flavor and also in the case of turmeric we found it has great medic medicinal properties then it doesn't take too much to try to find some other type of powder in that case and say color it orange and try to sell it as turmeric and so we see a lot of where it's hard to define you know what is oregano and what isn't oregano? Can you just cut up some leaves of something else and sell it as oregano? We see a lot of fraud in that market and those are also high value products. In the wine market, obviously when you have high value wines and champagnes, you're going to have people trying to take advantage of those situations as well. We also see fraud though in very low value, mass produced sort of markets. So one of the more recent, we have had a, a quite, actually the meat industry is a pretty big target for fraud. In 2013 in the United Kingdom, you may have heard of the horse meat scandal where gangsters had rounded up or actually nabbed horses from Eastern Europe and um, brought that meat into the United Kingdom and then that was mixed in with hamburger and sold to UK, um, UK consumers and let's just say the Brits aren't as wild about eating horses as people in Sweden and Italy and so that caused a lot of outrage there and is really actually what has sparked a large interest in food fraud in the United Kingdom. Powdered milk as I mentioned before is um, another uh, mass produced in milk, mass produced product, and rice. So there's several different ways food can be, um, the food fraud can take place. So if you want to think about food fraud as a big umbrella, these are the different areas under that umbrella where food fraud can take place. There can be dilution, and so that's an example of that is like things with like milk, honey can be diluted by adding high fructose corn syrup and basically taking, adding to this higher value product, sort of making, the, making it more of it with a lower value product. Concealment takes place when products, when additives or products are added to your food without you knowing about it. Mislabeling and misrepresentation is a type of food fraud. Actually, as we get more and more labels in this world, we now have a lot of labels for our food. We have certified organic, we have, um, we have all natural, we have a lot of labels and certifications that people look through. And almost any time we develop one of these new certifications, someone who has a fraudulent tendency can copy those labels and try to sell it for the premium as well. There's unapproved enhancement, which again goes to adding a color perhaps in the case of a spice or, or a drink or doing something and not telling the consumer about it in an effort to get more money from the consumer. There's counterfeiting, which you can have counterfeit um, Nutella and Reese's and all the different name brand products just like you can counterfeit Ralph Lauren and Versage and those sorts of things. Tampering is perhaps a product has been um, 
is is not high quality or has been tampered with for some way for some in some way and instead of stopping it and making sure that it doesn't reach the consumer the company or people involved continue to sell it substitution occurs when we have substitution of a low quality product for a high quality product this can ha easily happen with products that you may not be able to judge from looking at them so from food perhaps that isn't organic being substituted for food that is organic and you wouldn't know as a consumer particularly just eating it on a one-off um, experience and then this actually is my addition to the different types of food fraud that I see happening in the world and I'm going to just call it slavery we have food being produced in areas of the world which with indentured servants and child labor and a lot of times this goes unreported and of course then that food could be sold onto the international market for a lower price than food that is paid with legitimate or is made with legitimate labor. So I want to tell you a little tale. It's a sticky tale about honey. And so this is a case study we'll look at, if you will, for today. And I'll give you a little bit of a background first on how I got involved in honey research and why it is relevant to Wyoming. So I think bees have been an amazing um, sort of a celebrity within the wildlife and environmental world over the last 10 years. And a lot of this started with a colony collapse disorder that started in the late 2007, 2010 time, and then peaked around 2012 and 2013, where we saw a lot of bees being wiped out mysteriously. And it caused a lot of concern about honeybees and other bees in our environment. Bees had also been going through a tough time sort of before then. In the 1980s, the Varroa mite was introduced, and so we had a major decline in the amount of bees we have in the United States and the number of beekeepers we have. And we've continued to see that decline in the number of beekeepers. The average age of a beekeeper is over 55, appro appro approaching 60 within Wyoming and within the United States. So there's been concern in general about um, honeybees and wild bees. And at the same time, perhaps as a note of this, a bit of this concern has led to an all time high in consumer demand and interest in honey and honey related products. So in 2014 and 2015, we saw the highest demand we've ever seen for honey in the United States. So, um, well, honey producers and beekeepers face a lot of threats from Mother Nature. What I've learned from working with them is really one of their greatest threats is more one of human nature and the desire for other people out there to try to make money. And so there have been classic examples from the time from that acum in the 19th century to today of adulteration of honey where water or other inferior products such as high fructose corn syrup have been added to honey to dilute it and then that sold on as pure honey and it, when it really isn't. And as I mentioned in New Zealand with the Manuka honey, there's been even more incentives within the honey market for people to try to take advantage of increasing premiums here, there. So I first want to tell you a little bit about beekeeping in Wyoming. In Wyoming, we have approximately 125 registered beekeepers. Our beekeepers are kind of special because our bees, or shall we say our bees are kind of special, because our bees are some of the most productive bees in the nation. On average, um, we, have, we also have some of the largest beekeeping operations in the nation. On average, we have of the registered beekeepers, there's about 408 colonies per beekeeper. And like many things in the Wyoming economy, and I can't explain this, but I think it's curious, beekeeping is a little counter-cyclical here. So if you look at this graph, the green line is the average honey production across states in the United States, so the average U.S. honey production. The blue line, or sort of purple line, is the average in our region, so the average mountain state production. And the red line is Wyoming, here in the lower part. And what's kind of 
curious is it's almost like our general economy. It kind of goes against the grain of, of the nation. For some reason, we have our bees are, are more productive when the rest of the nation isn't so productive and less productive when they are. Um, but it does result in quite a bit of income to our, our state's economy. Um, this is the average income across states from honey production. And on average, most states um, are able to produce a, a little over um, $4 million in revenue, going up to $7 million in 2012 from honey production. In Wyoming, despite our larger quantity of honey being produced at times, we don't ever really reach that national average and, and given the productivity of our bees in terms of our honey revenue. And part of this is because our price for honey typically falls about 18% below the national average. So as an economist, this is a curious problem to me. I'm interested to know, is this just a function of our distance from consumer markets? Or are, is there something more we can do to market our honey? And more accurately, as someone who's interested in consumer preferences for honey, more uh, get more revenue from the honey that we sell. We do sell a lot of our honey to wholesalers. And could there be a, a option or a market to sell our honey more directly to consumers. I have to admit that's a problem I'm still working on. I've been doing consumer studies with honey and trying to understand what kind of consumers value our local honey versus um, ones that don't across the world and those sorts of things. But as I've studied this, um, what it has taught me though is I've learned a lot about the, um, actually sorry, that should be about the overall national honey market. So in trying to understand this price disparity between our Wyoming price and the national price, I started looking at what does the national honey market look like? And looking at it historically is it's, it's very interesting because we essentially went from in 1965 and through the 1980s, this, um, this green line up above represents our domestic honey production. And the red line below represents the amount of imports we've had in honey into the United States. And you'll see in around 2000, we went from being a net honey, like self-sufficient honey producer and exporter to a honey importer. And today about 60% of the honey that we consume comes from other nations, which I actually, I, I'm also a free trade economist. I think that's great. That's, um, I am all, all for taking advantage of comparative advantage and, and those sorts of things. But there are some things to be concerned about with some of the honey in the international market. Mainly, there's honey that enters the international market that is produced at environmental standards that we do not maintain here in the United States. Here in the United States, we have regulations on the type of chemicals that you can apply to your beehives because some of those chemicals can actually result in harm to consumers. For instance, bees, just like people, get sick and sometimes they need some antibiotics. We do not allow bee, uh, beekeepers to apply antibiotics with sulfa in it because if you're someone like me who has a sulfa allergy, you could actually have an allergic reaction to your honey for that reason. There is a lot of honey, the world's largest honey producer in terms of international markets is China, where they do not regulate that sort of thing. Also, due to the air pollution in China, we are seeing, we in about the mid um, 2000s, towards 2010, they started to see more and more um, levels of heavy metals like lead and mercury appearing in the honey because bees are like sponges in the environment picking up things that are around them and bringing them into the honey. So what happened as we became more of an importer, um, there was concern then brought to the World Trade Organization by beekeepers about China dumping honey into the international market. So in 2000, around 2000, 
uh, we implemented tariffs on Chinese honey being imported into the United States. We did not ban Chinese honey at that point, but then in about 2007, more of the scientific evidence about the contaminants into Chinese honey was brought forward to our government as well as government, governments into the EU, and Chinese honey was banned for importation into the US and the EU. So this graph shows you, it's a diagram of what import, what, where the imports of honey coming into the United States what they looked like and where they were coming from. The green line on top is the line for China. And you'll see in 2000, they had a lot of honey coming into our country and we implemented the tariffs. It dipped down, but then we started to see a lot more honey coming from China. Then we implemented the ban and it went down substantially. So that isn't too surprising, given the tariffs and the ban. What is to me, very interesting then, is these other lines represent other countries in the world, many of them around China. And so we have, um, suddenly, after we banned Chinese honey, we had a skyrocketing amount of honey being brought in from India and Malaysia. And as we will find out, what was happening then was Chinese honey was being laundered, if you will, and sent through these other locations into the international market. So today we still have a lot of Chinese honey on the market. China uh, is the top exporter in the world, producing um, nearly 12 million pounds of honey compared to um, Argentina, which is just around 6 million, and then, and then on down. So what we now know that we didn't know then is that the honey market had many conditions which made it prime for fraud. Whoops, yep. So what was happening in the, around 2010 is we as consumers were more interested in honey than ever. There was concern about obesity and the amount of raw sugar, or excuse me, refined sugar and high fructose corn syrup in our product, in our food. And so consumers were looking towards honey, agave, and other natural sweeteners as a way to have more honey in their food. So we had increasing consumer demand. There was a scarcity of the raw material. We had declining number of beekeepers. We had a ban on a major importer. Also, that major importer, though, China, could offer a very low-priced product compared to any other place in the world due to the production practices that they can have and other developed countries can't and the low cost of labor there. They had very cheap honey compared to honey coming from other parts of the world. And also, one thing that was hard to deal with on honey at that point, it's getting a little bit better now, it was hard to detect where honey was from. And honey could be um, pasteurized and filtered so that you couldn't tell where it was from. You, ideally, the number one way we would tell is where, what kind of pollen it contained. But if you wanted to get around that, you could process the 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 honey and filter the pollen out, which is indeed what honey people in the honey industry did. And I have to say, I've kind of made one mistake in my presentation, if you will, and that is I've, I've sort of characterized food fraud as something that gangs and terrorists do. Actually, the people most likely to commit food fraud are people working within food organizations and food companies. So in 2000 and 11, we had what I'm going to call um, the, the honey sting operation. And um, in this, we had 15 people from six different country, countries in a number of international locations were busted by Interpol, the FBI, and um, the Ger German uh, police for laundering honey and illegally importing it into the United States. Particularly, a lot of these executives were associated with a firm called the Alfred Wolf um, 
sweetener company. It was located in Germany, but it had representatives in China who worked with sweetener honey pr processors there to have the honey exported to surrounding nations, cleaned and filtered, and then imported into the United States. This was actually one of the largest food fraud cases in the world, at least our, our nation's history, um, totaling oh, about, to be estimated, worth about $80 million of damage at the time. But what I found find surprising is that few consumers really know about this. And so um, one thing that I think we need to do is increase consumer awareness of food fraud and also and improve our abilities to, do, to deal with it. So we can look now at what are steps we can take to move forward. The industry has learned as acting perhaps faster than anyone in trying to prevent food fraud. Major, major corporations such as Nestle have put out um, very lengthy reports on steps they are, Nestle, Cargill, um, are taking very big steps to try to prevent food fraud in their supply chain because they realize it's a great risk to their business. Some of the things that industry is doing right now to try to prevent food fraud include increasing and improving the traceability and transparency of food and where it comes from, being very specific about their purchasing arrangements and making sure that um, they are, have a very good relationship with their suppliers, going and literally visiting and walking through their suppliers and the food supply chain is very important. Utilizing data, we have big data now, there's um, a database called the USP database that industry is building together so that you can monitor incidences of food fraud around the world and look at your company, the types of products you're producing, and how likely it is that there could be something fraudulent in your product. And finally, um, industry is really trying to improve their surveillance programs and like other issues that go on in the world, improve their alert systems and encourage whistleblowing. Since a lot of this does take place within the industry, trying to make sure that people are not afraid to identify other people in their firm who might be doing something fraudulent. Where we probably need more concentrated effort is on the government and research side. One thing that I've become aware of is that a lot of times we think of this as happening sort of out there and at a global level when actually it can happen at a very local level. I've talked to producers who have developed a niche for their product in a local market, say selling to a white tablecloth um, restaurant, and been informed that unbeknownst to them there's a, a copycat producer out there trying to sell, say, um, lamb, shall we say, to a white table cloth restaurant in another city and saying it's from their farm. So food fraud can actually happen at a very local level. Um, and I think that just as we have food safety inspectors within our state, we could also have food fraud inspectors and people doing surveillance at that level. One thing that makes food fraud difficult to crack down on, if you will, at a national level is the lack of coordination across bureaucracies within the federal government. Um, there, if you were thinking about it, food, food is regulated by groups such as the FDA and USDA, but then crime is regulated by the Department of Justice and FBI. So being able to coordinate across these groups it takes time and takes a lot of resources that we don't have dedicated to that right now. We also need to increase our funding and have those resources available to fight food fraud. So as an economist, I also ask, what can I do? And so that's one thing we are asking on the research side. We're looking at lots of different things that we can do. First off, I've been working with colleagues around the globe to prioritize food fraud on our research agenda because it is probably the greatest threat um, facing the agribusiness industry. And then I work as a behavioral economist trying to understand people's preferences and value for different things. Um, I 
work on estimating the potential consumer losses from food fraud. What does it mean to you when you don't get what you're paying for? And perhaps for some consumers, they actually expect industry to be a little bit fraudulent. And how much are they willing to, expect, uh, willing to allow in terms of fraud? We can work with firms to try to understand what kind of group dynamics and group incentives will encourage or discourage fraud and work within industries to try to understand what sort of industry structure and regulations will encourage or discourage fraud. So there's lots of benefits from reducing food fraud. Obviously the number one is the health and safety of people. Industry is obviously interested because it's going to increase industry returns by reducing their risks. And ultimately, we would hope that to the degree that organized crime and terrorism are taking advantage of the food system, we can decrease the amount of funding that goes to them for food. And finally, you will be more satisfied as a consumer knowing you're getting what you pay for. So this is my, my presentation. Um, in review, we just... Um, I do want to emphasize that if it weren't for us people, our food system would be, <laughs> in some ways, would be safer than it's ever been. And um, that we, we tend to be a source uh, that, that rogue agents in the world, both within firms and out there um, within alternative organizations, tend to be our greatest risk. There's government and industry need to be vigilant, especially in markets where we have growing demand, but there's, not a, there's scarcity in the supply, and there's also alternative really low-cost suppliers out there offering inferior products. Um, and so the market um, needs to be able to regulate be, and be regulated uh, within, within some um, degree. And then um, we need to work together as myself, like as a, a researcher, and also with government and industry to try to do what we can to prevent this in the future. So um, I want to thank everyone who made this presentation possible. It's really a dream to get to present in Jackson in this wonderful location. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, she's asking if there's been re uh, relaxation of food safety regulations within the last year with our new change in administration, and do we see any on the horizon? Um, one thing that's been interesting about the change in leadership at the national level, I think this is looking broadly at agriculture, is they've left it alone. Um, there's, there seems to be higher priorities on their agenda. So, yeah. so, so I haven't, to my knowledge, seen any relaxation of food safety standards. To the degree this administration or any group could be more susceptible to the food industry and food lobbying that may push to that, that could be possible. And I think, as we, I was thinking about this, you know, um, there is economic argument that to some degree industries will, will regulate themselves, definitely to the point that it improves their profits. But I think we all learned from things like the, the, bank, the banking scandal in 2007 and 2008 that industry regulation isn't enough and that we need to remain vigilant at a government level as well. Yep. So, all right. Sir. Do you have an opinion on the so-called Food Freedom Act recently passed by all Is that the one that allows people to do things like um, get milk from a cow and those, like their own local, dry shares in a cow and those sorts of things? Um, I have to say, I, I do not have a, a particular opinion on it. I think, um, to me, I think that we, so, we take, um, sorry, let me just think about this. Um, 
I personally um, have concerns about that in, in to the degree that this is where I think we do need to be aware at a local level of what thing, I guess I, I, I push obviously a little bit more maybe for regulation than deregulation and that one of the um, challenges to Wyoming and marketing to the rest of the world has been um, concerns about our like safety and certification practices within our state. And so um, I actually, it's been over, it's been a while since I looked particularly at that bill, but I would be careful about things that um, lead to the, the opportunity for more, more fraud or unregulated behavior. So, okay, all right, um, over here on the right. Could you define in the beekeeping world or in the bees uh, what local honey is? is ah, that's a great question. So she's asking me to define in the world what local honey is. And so local is where I think we can have, actually, this is where sort of like getting at this, where we need regulation at a local level is often in the definition of local because I've been in restaurants where there's really a product sourced from two states away and they're selling it as local. Um, so we actually ran a study with consumers of honey in Wyoming and we defined it as something from Wyoming. Um, and so that, that's something that gets, there's, there's like a whole stream of literature on it as far as um, how people think about that and what it means to them. All right, um, let's see. Sir in the plaid shirt right here. Okay. I've heard uh, heard some olive oil. <laughs> I didn't mention it at all. It's yeah. Uh, right, yeah, so actually that's what, if I went point by point through my title, that's what I think of, that's like what I think of as modern day snake oil. So, um, <laughs> One of my colleagues down, and he's working at Colorado State University, Alessandro Bonanno, and he happens to be from Italy. And so he's doing special simulations on um, what conditions have led to the high amount of um, low quality olive oil being substituted for high quality olive oil. And that is a major market. And especially because, I, well, that's, I don't want to say because, um, especially due to the fact that that's an Italian product and the mafia is based in Italy. Um, it's more, it's more sub, um, subject to fraud. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Over here in the navy blue, sir, on the wall. Yes. Well, I haven't per se, but I, I'm aware of it. And I have colleagues who are some of the first to do research on this at the University of Wyoming. Um, and that is the problem, yes. There is a higher willingness to pay for grass-fed. We can produce grass-fed, but we do not have a USDA-inspected slaughterhouse in the state. And it makes it even difficult for people who want to sell grass-fed. Like, if I want to buy grass-fed from someone in Rollins, and they want to have much of a market beyond Rollins, it's, it's difficult because they do not have an a inspected slaughterhouse. One thing that has been proposed as a way to get around that, at least at a very small scale, is to have mobile slaughterhouses that would be USDA inspected. But there has, in other states such, I think Colorado had a, has it, I know New Mexico has it. It would take some sort, perhaps, of investment or entrepreneurship effort in that area to do that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Thank you.